This series is going to focus on marital problems and issues that surround divorce, as well as questions regarding not only getting the divorce, questions regarding remarriage, because most of the people who get a divorce at some time later on remarry, and a lot of times we, don't have, we have a lot of questions about that. So I need to address that, and more importantly, address that from a biblical perspective perspective. Uh, before I uh, start this lesson, I'd like to share some statistics with you. That's always a good place to start. Uh, divorce rate in America, about 50% based on current projections, and that's including all categories. Um, according to researcher Jennifer Baker of the Forest Institute of Professional Psychology, the divorce rate is as follows. For first marriages, 41%. For second marriages, 60%. For third marriages, 73%. Isn't that amazing? We always think, well, you know, I blew it the first time, but I'm really going to, you know, I don't need anybody to tell me. I know about marriage. I've been divorced. You know, I've failed at marriage, so I, I know it all now. I'm going to get married. You know, so people, they don't learn you know, they don't learn about the things that may have caused the divorce in the first place in their first marriage, and a lot of times they bring that same baggage into the second marriage, and, and they fail at it, of course. Uh, according to sociologists, childless couples have a 66% divorce rate. Childless, for whatever reason, I mean, they choose not to have children, they never had children, they can't have children, that factor in their relationship you know, causes a lot of stress and divorce. The most disturbing statistic that I found, however, um, was the one that puts conservative Christian groups with the highest divorce rate among religious groups, even higher than the divorce rate among atheists. <laughs> conservative Christian groups higher divorce rate than among atheists. That's according to the Barna Group, Evangelical Christian Research and Survey Organization. The Barna Group is not some you know, wacko online conspiracy group. This is a you know, very uh, uh, mainstream, well-regarded research uh, organization. So uh, after uh, you know, 37 years of ministry, I'm sad to report that my experience in dealing with couples bears out the truth about these statistics. You know, the idea that 50% uh, divorce rate, evangelical or conservative Christians have a higher divorce rate than, than atheists. Uh, I'm, 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 I have to sadly um, acknowledge that uh, uh, I've seen this happen. You know, I've worked in small congregations in Mission Points. I've worked for very large congregations in the middle of the Bible Belt. I've, I've gone to preach in other countries with a different culture altogether, but the, but the same thing comes back all the time. All the time. Unfortunately, if I look back over my own ministry, I can see that I have unsuccessfully counseled many more couples who have decided to go ahead and divorce than those who have chosen to remain married despite their problems. So if I was getting paid you know, based on how many couples stayed together that I counseled, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't be making a lot of money because I, you know, I don't take that on as a personal failure, it's just an observation. So if you look at the various uh, websites that provide information on the causes for such an increase in the divorce rate, they'll say things like, well, it's the rise of the number of women in the workforce. They'll say that, that puts pressure on marriage. Or the demands of two, co two careers, you know, two people who take their careers very seriously, who are married to each other, and at the same time trying to raise children, and you know, that puts pressure. Um, uh, another, uh, another cause, they say, the facility of low-cost divorce itself. I mean, you're driving around and what do you see? You see like a little stake in the ground with a handwritten paper, you know, divorce, you know, $49. <laughs> you 
when I was growing up, uh, if someone uh, was getting a divorce, it always cost thousands of dollars. It was a big, you know, it was a big deal. It was uh, shocking uh, to everyone. Uh, you know, it, was, it was much more difficult today. 49 bucks, you're in, you're out, sign the paper, see ya. One writer, in noting that the highest rates of divorce occurred in the Bible Belt, states like Oklahoma, right? We've got churches, not just churches of Christ, but look at the corner here. We've got churches everywhere, every block there's a church, and yet, with all of this Christianity being represented in this state, we have the highest you know, rate of divorce. So one writer in noting this concluded that the Christian religion was somehow to blame for the many broken marriages in America. I, I, don't, believe that's, I don't believe that, but you could kind of come to that conclusion if you just look at the stats. My own theory is that people who divorce usually break the very same time-tested rules established by God for a happy and successful marriage. This is why this first lesson is entitled, you know, Seven Steps to a Successful Divorce. I say that, of course, tongue in cheek. Although some people have taken me seriously on this. They've seen the first lesson title and you know, thought this was a serious class about how to, <laughs> how to destroy a marriage. But I call it seven steps to a successful divorce because it seems that people who end up divorcing purposefully do all the things that will guarantee marriage failure while refusing the things that lead to success. So if you want a successful divorce, here are the can't miss steps that you need to take. Seven steps to a successful divorce. Step number one, do not leave. Do not leave. In Genesis 2.24a, the Bible explains the natural progression that takes place when two people are joined in marriage as one new family unit. The Bible says, for this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother. Now it says, for this cause a man shall leave his father and his mother. The cause is to leave, uh, or the cause rather to leave father and mother is not because I've got a job or we're old enough to make our own decisions, or mom and I disagree about things. I mean, there's a natural bond between parents and children that remains even when they become adults, of course. However, when a son or a daughter marries, there is a leaving. The Hebrew word here means to loosen or to forsake. There is a leaving of the parental bond in order to form a new bond or union with our spouse. Now, a successful divorce, down line, requires that you not leave your parents, but somehow graft them in to your new union. Sometimes it's the child that does this. You know, it's the, the young person that does this. By not taking on the role of husband or wife, but simply treating the marriage like an extension of the parental family. Many times it's the parents who, with good intentions, interfere in their child's marriage by not allowing them or allowing their child's spouse to form a completely independent unit. You know, there's a role for parents to play, but it is a supportive role, a one of example, one of encouragement. But too many young people get married and they assume that their mothers will raise their children and their fathers will provide leadership and support because they're too immature to take on their own responsibilities for married life. Well, if that's the case, don't get married. And too many parents enable their children's immaturity and self-centeredness out of a misplaced fear that their children might suffer if they don't smooth out every single bump in the road for them. Remember I said 41% of first marriages fail? And one of the common denominators in these broken unions is the unwillingness of young people to leave and work out their married lives on their own. You know, uh, Lise and I, we have a thing that we do. It's a very small thing. All of our children are married. Three of them live close by, as you know. 
And one of the things that we do is we always, always call ahead if we're going to drop in. Even if it's just what we call a drive-by hug, you know, we're not staying for coffee, we're not having a drink or anything like that. We're just coming by to squeeze the kids and say hi and how's your week and then we're gone. Even for that, we call ahead. We never just drop in out of the sky. Now my son and my son-in-law in the audience are probably you know, going back, fact checking what I've just said. But that is our intention. So if we want a successful divorce, see to it that you do everything you can to manage your children's marriage relationship. And you young marrieds, make sure you never leave home. Step number two, do not cleave. You know, that same passage in Genesis 2.24 goes on to say, they will, leave, they, they will leave father and mother and shall cleave, meaning join to his wife. The word cleave in some of the older versions means to cling or to stick to. For example, you're in a sailboat being tossed by an 80 mile an hour wind and huge waves. So what do you do? You cleave to the rail or you cleave to the, main, uh, to the mast so you won't be swept overboard. That's the, uh, that's the meaning of that word. Well, in a marriage, that cleaving is the creation of a special intimacy that no one can penetrate because it's off limits to everybody else except the two partners. And you create it through honest, constant, complete, and loving communication. But a successful divorce if that's what you want, requires that you circumvent any attempt at clinging, cleaving, or communication. Make sure you do that. Guarantee your divorce. Make sure that your spouse is the last person to know anything that's going on. <laughs> Make sure your spouse finds out about what's going on in your household on Facebook <laughs> instead of from you. And this is important, Always confide your feelings to your Facebook friends or your coworkers instead of your spouse. And spare no effort to give your spouse the impression that they are not a priority with you. You know, some cleave to their jobs or they cleave to their cars or their hobbies or their friends anything or anyone except the one that they originally left their parents to cleave or to cling to. So successful divorces report that the breakup was no big deal because they didn't feel that they were very important anyways. You know, Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And I'm saying to you, your spouse is your treasure here on this earth. So if you want to succeed at divorce, work at making your spouse anything but your first priority in human relationships. And you can't miss, you can't miss. Step number three, do violate, do violate the one flesh principle. In Genesis 2, 24 and five, the Bible says, and they shall become one flesh and the man and his wife are both naked and not ashamed. So the simple phrase, or this simple phrase, encompasses the entire mystery and beauty and sacredness of the sexual relationship that takes place within the framework of, of marriage. It's within this one flesh union that the couple experiences its deepest feelings of love and intimacy, pleasure, reassurance, and comfort. You know, author Tim Gardner in his book, Sacred Sex, says that sex is holy and is in some ways a foretaste of heaven. And you know, sometimes we want to laugh when we hear that, but think about it for a second. Is there, when it's, when it's proper, when it's good, when it's right, when it's beautiful, is there anything physically that comes even close to that moment that, that, that of, of sexual intimacy between two people? I, I get the idea that that's a foretaste of heaven. He's not saying that that's what heaven is like, but certainly to the height of pleasure and intimacy. So those who seek to successfully divorce, they need to find ways to violate this one flesh principle. In other words, 
try to add something else to the basic standard of one man bonded to one woman. For example, let's try bringing porn into the mix. Let's do that. Yeah, let's mix some pornography in there. Well, it's just me and my wife and the porn. Or uh, let's be unfaithful emotionally with someone else. A lot of times, you know, we, we're more intimate with our coffee break person than we are with our with our spouse, even, even if we don't have a physical relationship with them, some people have an intimate relationship with them. And of course, you know, let's, let's be unfaithful physically with someone else. That's a good tactic. Perhaps you can use sex as a weapon or a bargaining chip to get your way. Yeah, that's good, do that. That'll really help. And by all means, Make sure that you always focus on your own needs first. Make sure that you do that. Every successful divorce has unfulfilled sexual needs as a basic component. I'm not saying that it's always about sex. I'm not saying that it's always about sex. What I'm saying is that sex is usually one of the components that leads to a divorce. Step number four, do not multiply. Do not multiply. The very first command God gave to man and woman was be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, Genesis 1.28. Do you think there's any relationship between the fact that in American society women are having fewer children and having them later in life and the rising rate of divorce? Do you think there might be some link there somewhere? In 2010, the last year we had some stats, the United States recorded its lowest birth rate in a century, 13 births per thousand people. This is not enough to replace our population at the current level. Why do you think there's such, <laughs> there's such a trouble with immigration? If we want to keep the population where it's at, we need our immigration because we're not reproducing fast enough to you know, sustain our population and we have to have this level of population in order to sustain the, the wealth of the country. If, if the United States goes down to being a, a nation that only has 100 million people, I guarantee you we're not going to have the same standard of living. So there's the, really the tension between you know, immigration and no immigration, too much immigration. The cause of it is, we, we're not replacing ourselves. And as I mentioned at the beginning, 66% of divorces happen to childless couples. Again, there are a lot of reasons people cannot have children, obviously. I'm just saying, the statistics say when there are no children, the rate of divorce is higher. So successful divorcing requires a commitment to worldly things like careers, toys, self-fulfillment, not time-consuming things like children, family, and home building. Oh no, don't get involved children and home building and things like that. Don't, don't get involved in that kind of discomfort because uh, yeah, you might succeed. All right, number five, do not submit. So far I've spoken in general terms about what either spouse can do to sabotage their marriage, but now I'd like to get gender specific and you know, start with the ladies. Now ladies, whatever you do, make sure that you undermine any attempt by your husband to take seriously what Paul says in Ephesians chapter five, verse 22 to 24. And I've got it up there, it says, wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. So if your husband has any intention of becoming a spiritual or moral leader or gives any evidence that he wants to serve as provider and protector, if he gives off any of those vibes, make sure that you remind him that these are outdated ideas and have no place in today's real world. Make sure you do that. And let him know that no man will ever tell you what to do. 
and show him your paycheck as proof of your independence. And never let anyone see or even think that you count on him to lead you as well as your family. And if perchance he has a, a lot of the issues and weaknesses and he's not a natural leader, then do not encourage or facilitate his leadership. Rather, see to it that you step into the void and take charge yourself. Do not let an opportunity go by to remind him that he's not the leader and you're not in submission to him. If you follow those rules, guarantee you divorce is on the way. And here's the tipping point. Always broadcast these things to your family and friends so they are aware that you're not a woman in submission. Follow these patterns of behavior and you will guarantee your unhappiness and eventual divorce. Step number six, do not love. Isn't it interesting that in the New Testament the only time God commands love within a marriage, it's to the men he's talking to, not to the women. Ephesians 5, so husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ also does the church. Now I don't know why only men are encouraged to love their wives as they love their own bodies. Maybe it's because God knew that sinful men's tendencies would be to love themselves first. You know, it seems that a woman's nature draws her to sacrificial love as she bears and raises children. Men, on the other hand, have no such natural tendency. They have to learn it. So the successful divorced male has to constantly give in to his natural inclination to use and to consume, because that's what he's about. So he must remain focused on himself and what makes him feel good and what makes him feel you know, uh, um, uh, affirmed. Um, he needs to concentrate on what will satisfy and protect his fragile ego. Make sure you do that. And he is required to invest in those things that will support his interior image of himself as a real man in a man's world. So to successfully divorce, he must avoid spiritual leadership by example. He must avoid claiming his rightful position in the family given to him by God. He must avoid making any sacrifice of time, money, or effort that will only benefit his wife and children and not himself. Don't do that. You know, if you, whatever you do, do not sacrifice yourself or your wife or children. They might begin to think that you love them more than you love yourself. Of course, not sharing his thoughts and feelings or getting angry when his sexual needs are not met and assuming that he is never at fault and never needs forgiveness. These are just bonus points, just bonus points that speed the divorce process along. You know, married life, among other things, has been designed to teach men how to love. Refusing to learn this lesson, this is the fastest road to divorce. And then number seven, don't seek. Don't seek help. I've given some general principles and some gender specific ones and now one last idea intended for the couple. To make sure that there's no chance that your marriage revives and spoils your divorce, whatever you do, do not get any meaningful help. You know, God knows that when you take two sinful human beings and you set them into a lifetime commitment of marriage, there are going to be problems. This is why Paul spends a considerable amount of time in 1 Corinthians discussing the, you know, the various issues surrounding troubled marriages. He even counsels some on what to do when things really get bad. So let's read that, 1 Corinthians 7. He says, now concerning the things about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to touch a woman, but because of immoralities, each man is to have his own wife and each woman is to have her own husband. The husband must fulfill his duty to his wife and likewise also the wife to her husband. 
The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise also the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Stop depriving one another, except by agreement for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer and come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So obviously there were troubled marriages in the church at Corinth. And so the brethren sought help from the apostle about these matters. But if you want to successfully divorce, why reach out for help? You might wreck your divorce. If you're serious about divorce, then you'll need to concentrate on ways of getting out of your marriage instead of ways of staying in your marriage. Maybe you know, start a relationship with somebody else instead of working on the relationship you have with your spouse. That's one of the most common things I see you know, in my experience. One of the partners, you know, things are not going well. Instead of getting help, they start a relationship with someone else and then they wonder why their marriage isn't kind of improving. <laughs> or perhaps you can round up a posse of people who can sympathize with you and make your spouse the common enemy. Maybe that's what you can do. Or uh, my personal favorite, tell everybody who's willing to listen what a lousy marriage you have. Now, I repeat the essence of step number seven. Whatever you do, don't get qualified, certified, long-term help because it may just work and spoil the divorce. Of course, you can do what most people do to calm their conscience. Visit your clergyman a few times once the marriage is terminal and see if he can perform a miracle in resurrecting a dead relationship. This will help in the future when people ask, well, did you try counseling? Then you can answer, well, we even went to see our minister, but it didn't work. <laughs> but under no circumstances are you to try heroic measures to save your marriage in the way that you try to save your life if you had cancer, for example. My point is, would you go through the same kind of pain to save your marriage as you would to go through to save yourself from cancer? You know, would you do six months of chemo? If the, if the guy says, would you do six months of chemo? I think we can get the tumor and we can add 20, 30 years to your life. After all, you're only 50 years old, you know? Would you do the six months of uh, nausea and pain and sleeplessness? And would you do the six months to save your life? Well, would you do six months of intensive counseling to save your marriage? You know, successful divorces, they're difficult. They're difficult to accomplish in the face of, as I say, six months of intense counseling with a professional therapist working with a couple determined to save their marriage. And listen, I, I get it. You know, I, I can almost hear the questions <laughs> coming. It takes two people. <laughs> Remember I said the couple is willing to work. One person, only one person can't save a man. One person going to counseling doesn't usually save the marriage. They got to be two people. Because the, the fault, the trouble, you know, whatever the cause is, it, it's a two person thing. So let's summarize. There you have it. Seven steps to a successful divorce. Six don'ts, one do. Number one, don't leave parents. Allow them to interfere or replace your partner in priority. Number two, don't cleave to your spouse. Make sure to love somebody else or something else first. Number three, don't violate, or, uh, don't, um, uh, don't cleave uh, to your spouse. Allow someone else or something else to share your sexual intimacy. Number four, don't multiply. Make something else the focus of your married life other than your family. Number five, don't submit, follow the world's advice on the role of women instead of God's word on the role of women. Number six, don't love, refuse to be the sacrificial leader of your home. Don't take on that role. Number seven, don't get any help. Look for excuses to break your vows instead of getting real help to keep them. Of course, for the record, you know that the last thing I ever want for anybody is for their marriage to end in divorce. 
what would be terrible is if somebody happened to go on, <laughs> on the internet and miss the first third of this lesson and just pick it up you know, at point number three, they'd think that we're crazy here, we're mad. You know? We have to realize that if we follow the steps that lead to divorce, that's where we'll end up. If we do these things, there's no way, that, there's no other solution, there's no other end rather. And it's amazing to me that year after year I see people who know the Lord, who believe, who know His word, refuse to follow His instructions in order to build strong marriages. Do leave parents and do cleave and and make your spouse your priority and make sure everybody knows it. And don't violate in any way the one flesh principle. And do multiply and build your marriage and home and family on God's promises and His, His word. And do take on the roles assigned by God for men and women in marriage. And when there are problems, do everything you can to make your relationship work. You know, divorce a terrible thing and quite painful as many of our members who have been touched by divorce know. Thankfully, we have the grace of God and the mercy of the cross of Christ to wash away our failures, to wash away our sins in every area of life, and that includes the sin of divorce. But why go through the pain and heartache in the first place? Why risk our souls with such a sin? You know, God's word tells us how to succeed at marriage, not divorce. There are thousands of books and seminars, each trying to explain how to have a happy marriage, and I applaud their efforts. But in the end, however, they all boil down to the simple things that we spoke of today. And of course, I, I, I've, you know, I've said these things a, a little bit tongue in cheek uh, in order to kind of make my point here, uh, but I don't minimize uh, the seriousness of divorce and I do not minimize the pain of it. I do not minimize the pain of it. It is an extremely excruciating experience. Uh, and unlike cancer, you know, uh, it just doesn't end. You, know, you don't just go through your treatment for four or five months and then you're okay. With a divorce, if it happens to you personally, you know, never mind if it's in your family, it keeps affecting you. It goes on and on and on and on, not month after month, but year after year. So it is a very traumatic experience and uh, I certainly don't mean to make light of it. But I wanted this first lesson you know, to kick off our, our series, you know, to uh, actually to just point out the obvious. These things are so obvious. Now we're going to move on to other things. Next time we're going to talk about what to do in case of divorce. So we'll, get, we'll really get into the subject matter. You know, you're in the middle of one or you're about to have one or your, your son or your daughter is having one or you know, whatever. What, what do you do? You know, well, how, can, how do you handle that situation? So we're going to get into those kind of meat and potatoes issues. You know. Then what happens after? Okay, you've been divorced. What happens now? What do we do now? You know? So we'll cover all of that material as we, uh, as we work our way through that lesson. All right, so thanks for your attention.